All right. Thank, thank you very much. This, this, even though I've been doing Python for a while, this is actually the first time that I've been to EuroPython. So if you're a first time attendee, come find me and we can talk about it here. Uh, uh, as far as the, the talk here, okay, dye threads. I had a number of people uh, coming up to me last night. They're like, oh, this is some German joke or something like that. And I, I, I'm like, unfortunately, no, actually a lot of threads are gonna die in this talk. We'll get to that. Um, so to, uh, to, to start the talk off, I'm gonna throw up a, a sort of a deep thought to uh, ponder here. Uh, you know, when, when threads sleep, do they dream? Um, I don't know what would possess someone to come up with that thought. Um, maybe it's related to this tweet that I saw recently, because you know, while, while you're pondering the first, um, the first thought there, I saw, saw this. I don't, I don't know Jackson, I apologize Jackson, but I, I, I saw this and it's like, hmm, you know, what problem am I trying to create with this code? Uh, maybe this is, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about like what problem am I trying to create with this talk, but we'll, we'll get to that. Okay, so the thing that I'm, I'm thinking about in this talk is actually kind of the, the more stuff with the world of async. So there's been a lot of stuff with async programming going on in Python. Uh, I've given some talks about various aspects of that, and I'm not really gonna, gonna repeat that here, but um, one thing with, with kind of the world of async is you've got this, you have two different worlds of Python functions that have emerged. You have the sort of the normal nice Python functions, you know, where, uh, you know, the, the tomato case there, and then you have this, this async world of functions you know, the tomato case, you know, the famous song here. And I'm really interested in the way that, this, that these two worlds kind of interact because it's, it's sort of a very interesting thing having a programming language with two different types of functions in there. And where you can get into sort of strange things is if you try to mix these two worlds together. Like if you try to write a normal Python function and then all of a sudden you try to, to go into like async, um, the way they call an async function is with await, you're, you're basically gonna get shut off doing that, okay? It's like, Python hates that. It's like, you can't call async from the world of, of synchronous code. Uh, but you also run into problems if you go the other way. Like if you're, if you're using async IO or async or something, you're writing async functions and then you decide to execute like a, like a synchronous, you know, normal Python function in there. What happens at that point? Um, I mean, anything could happen. I mean, it, it, it's like a normal Python function. It could launch a thread, it could block, it could go compute Fibonacci numbers or mine Bitcoins or whatever. It's, it's sort of, uh, there, there's sort of, there's, there's sort of lots of problems with that. So I kind of look at this situation and it's like, huh, that's just weird. It's like, okay, it's like you have these two, these two worlds of functions and there's all sorts of bad things that can happen. So. Stepping back from that a moment, um, one of the things that I, that I kind of ask people when I teach and meet people is, is this question of, why are you using async programming? This is a, actually a big question. You know, it's like, why would you go into this world of async where you have all these async functions and so forth? And typical answers that come up are things like, well, we're, we're Twitter or Facebook or something like that. And it's like, oh, okay, that, that's probably a good use case. I mean, one, one benefit of, of async is large scaling, large, lots of clients and so forth. But a lot of Python programmers like myself, it's like, I'm not Twitter. It's like, I'm not doing things at that kind of scale. Okay, so I'm, I'm not really so interested in that. Um, another question, you know, another response we sometimes get is, well, there's the, the global interpreter lag. And I sort of feel bad about that because I, I sort of blew up the, the gill like eight years ago in some talk and everybody points at it and, and it's like, ah, oh, Python evil because of the, because of the gill. Um, that's, a, that's a little weird too because uh, if you get into asynchronous programming, it doesn't really solve the gill. I mean, you still have it. It's just, you're just getting rid of threads. I mean, it's, it's like you're not getting any real benefit related to that. So I'm not... I'm not so interested in that either. I mean, we're not gonna, we're not gonna fix that problem. Um, but then there's this, this third thing that comes up, which is just people's impressions of threads. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm sort of curious, I mean, how many people have done thread programming in here at one point or another? I'm, I'm a little bit curious if your experience with thread programming is kind of like my experience with thread programming. So you run some thread program, and then it just sits there and like nothing happens. And then you, and then you like hit control C and then like nothing still happens. And then you hit it a few more times and you're like, 
no, okay, this sucks. And then like, finally you, have, you control Z the whole thing, and then you have to find your like Python process and then like kill minus nine it or something like that. Is that, yeah, okay, so, yeah, all right, died. That, now we're getting into the German part of the talk here. The die, die threads die here. Um, no, this, I think that's like a common experience with threads as you do this and it's, it's like, oh, God, it's like ter terrible experience there. Um, it's not just this though. I think if you look at threads, there's a lot of just weird stuff about it. Like, uh, like even creating a thread is kind of annoying. I often teach people in classes, it's like, hey, this is how you create a thread. Um, and they, they sort of ignore the whole thing that's up here and then focus on like the one tuple in the, at the end. Like, why is it five comma? And then there's a whole discussion about that. And then, um, or, or the only way to create a thread is to use everybody's favorite feature, which is inheritance, obviously. I mean, you gotta do that. So, you know, like creating threads is sort of weird. Um, communicating with a thread is sort of Annoying, like let's say you have a thread and, and, and you want to return a result back. You would think that there would be some easy way to do that, like you start a thread and then you join it and you get the result and like, no. I mean, it, it's like threads basically you launch them and they just sort of fall off the end of the universe or the, the edge of the world. Um, the only way to get a result back is you, you have to arrange for it. Maybe you mess around with futures or some other other thing, but you know the code is already kind of making me you know kind of cry a little bit with the with the added complexity, um, and then and then you get into things like can you cancel a thread or kill it or something? I mean this is a whole you know whole big topic that we'll get to in a second, but it, it's like if you want to kill a thread, you're basically on your own, you know roll on the floor laughing kind of, kind of, kind of thing with that. Uh, if, you, if you do some searching online, by the way, you might find people saying like, well actually, have you considered using C types to kill a thread? And then, no, like, you'll find answers like, oh, you can, you can like uh, just directly go into like the POSIX library or something and nuke your program with using C types. Like, no, don't, don't do that. So, so I think about this, this like thread experience and it's like, this is just bad. Um, but they basically work, I mean, for some definition of work. I mean, one benefit of threads is, you know, you can run normal code in threads. Probably works. You don't have to rewrite the whole universe, so, I mean, you kind of you, you kind of get that, but it's still not a great, great experience. And maybe because of that experience, that is, is maybe a big appeal of some of the async stuff. I mean, it's, in some sense, it's like a new, you know, it's like a new starting point. And maybe an appeal is, you know, you can kind of rebuild the universe or something. It's like, well, let's do it right this time and, and see, what, see what happens. Uh, whether it's going to end up like the slide on the right, I don't know. But it's, you know, kind of, you know, kind of trying to rebuild things. And you do see this. I mean, there's, there's a lot of people working on async libraries, like versions of async libraries to do different things like HTTP and requests and database and Redis and all this, all this stuff. And this is, this, there's actually a lot of very interesting things going on with this. I mean, if you look at some of the talks on it and some of the work, I mean, it's, there's, some, there's some cool ideas, you know, like, that, like the sans IO stuff, trying to get rid of IO and so forth. But, but, but I'm, I'm sort of looking at this and thinking about it. I had this sort of thought like, um, couldn't you just rewrite threads? Or maybe could you re-envision threads? I mean, if we're gonna re-envision everything else, maybe we could re-envision threads at the same time. So I'm gonna do a little experiment of re-envisioning threads here. This is gonna do, involve some live coding and some demos. Um, and it's, it's more of a, of a thought experiment. And I, and I just wanna, I wanna preface this by saying this is nothing that's suitable for any kind of production or anything at this time. This is purely, uh, purely experimental. So um, the thing that I'm, that I'm kind of thinking about is you know, what if there were, were like a replacement thread library? I don't know, we're, we're, we're basically gonna redo threads. That's kind of our, uh, our, our thought. So, may, so maybe I'm gonna have some library that involves the word redo. I don't know, maybe we call it Threado. It's a bad name, but you need a, you need a cute name for your, your library there. Actually, Threado sounds really awesome if you lower your voice and you say, Threado or something. Don't, actually, don't, don't do that. Um, so, so imagine that you had like a, this sort of new thread library 
And you tried to fix like all these problems that you hated about the old one. So, so maybe just like, like starting off, let's say, um, let's say you had a simple function like that. And you just wanted to launch a thread and get the result back. I would really like to have some easier way to do this where you could just say, well, let's just spawn that function with those arguments and then just get the result back. Maybe, maybe you do that. Don't have inheritance, don't have the one tuple, uh, don't involve futures and all this stuff. Just, just try to do something really simple like that um, and, and see what that would look like. Now, I'll see if I can find my cursor here. So run that, maybe we'll call this EX, EX1 here. Oh, and you have to give it an argument here, okay. You always have to do debugging in the, uh, in the talk here, okay. So maybe you, could, maybe you could just start with that. Just give my like, threads just, just a better experience from the start, basically. It's like, okay, you have a function, you can call it, you can get, you can get the result. Um, you might be able to do some things with errors as well. Um, you know, maybe, like, let, let's say somebody called this with a, like, bad, like, bad types or something. Instead of, instead of just having, like, right now with threads, if you crash, they sort of print a message and then disappear off into the vapor or something like that. Maybe you could just take that and have it return like a wrapped exception or something. One feature of Python 3 is that you've got these, uh, these, like, like these chained exception objects. So you can, you can basically package up exceptions in kind of a nice way. Maybe you do that. Well, let's just try running that. Okay, so it failed and you've got a type error. So one thing on, on, on this, this hypothetical, you know, sort of new thread thing is actually just sort of you know, fixing the way that you launch thread. Um, the other thing that you would want to do, okay, so let's, let's do another, next, next thing you want to do, maybe we'll do example two here, um, is actually make sure that it's real thread. Like you actually have some kind of actual concurrency going on here. So um, let's, let's write a function that, that, that basically takes like a counter and some label and then maybe, maybe does like some very intensive CPU calculation with it. This is not the most interesting example, perhaps, but what we're gonna do is just create a running total, we'll decrement n, and then maybe every so often we'll print out something. Do people know you can, uh, you can do the underscore in numbers in Python now? Kind of a nice, kind of a nice thing. So, Maybe you have a function like that. One of the things that, that we should have in this thread library is the ability to spawn like two of these things. I don't know, let's count down from like 60 million. We'll call this one thread one. So the, the label is just so that we can see them, the different things are on. join. Okay, so maybe, maybe you have code like that. Okay, looks, looks sort of like threads, but you know, slightly different interface. So we're doing is spawning that function off, you know, twice, and we're just, mainly what we're going to do here is just see if they run at the same time. Um, one of the things, just to note, if you, if you were to do something like this in like an async framework, launching a big CPU bound dot job like that would just grind the whole thing to a halt and then nothing would happen until it's done. So we're, we're trying to not, we don't want that. Okay, let's, let's run that here. Okay, so this thing is, this thing is kind of churning along. Um, and you see both threads making progress. They, they're both kind of going at about the same time printing stuff out. So one of the things that you have here is it, it, it basically is real threads. It's not, you know, it's not green lips, it's not async or anything like that. So it actually is a, you know, you do get the kind of the normal concurrency there. But the, uh, the next thing that you want though, and this is, this is where the death is gonna start, I apologize for that. Um, it'd be really nice if you could actually have these things die in some, some way. I mean, that, that's the thought that most people have with threads is, you know, can, can, you, um, can you make them die in some way? So let's say you had a function, you know, 
that just did something trivially dumb here, like maybe sleep for like 10 seconds, like, like that. We're gonna, we're gonna launch it, and then we're gonna, we're gonna sleep our, well, let's just, let's just wait for it here. There's no result coming back, so I'm just gonna wait for a minute. So, so what this is gonna do is um, just sleep for a moment, and then run, I keep missing that main at the end there. Your, your job is to catch me on all typos, by the way, so if you uh, see, see something, yell it out, say, yeah, hey, you're forgetting something. So, so this thing is, is sleeping for 10 seconds, and it comes back. Um, the thing that would be really nice, and this is the thing that threads cannot do, is just have the ability to um, kill them brief, uh, immediately. Like, can I do something like that? So instead of waiting for it, can I just cancel the thing? Let's, let's try that and see what happens. Okay, so yawn, and then it just comes back. I mean, you never see, you never see a return at that point. Um, Essentially, what you've, what you've got here is like a cancellation mechanism built into threads where it's, where it's just like, eh, we're done with it, cancel it. Um, the other thing that would be nice about that would be if you could catch it in the thread itself. Like maybe you could wrap this with, a, with like a try accept or something. And do something in response to it. So let's, let's, let's try that. Okay, so it comes back and it's like I canceled it. So, so this is kind of a kind of a, a starting point. We're going to do more with this in a in a second. But the idea is let's re envision threads a little bit. It's like get 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 rid of the crazy creation process. Get rid of the uh, the, the the lack of ability to return a result, and then add these this this cancellation stuff into it. Now, keeping with the title of the talk. Kind of want to run with this cancellation idea a little bit. This is um, actually, I think, a really big point of some of these async frameworks, is that they actually give you a lot of control over what happens on the in your program. I mean, that's actually a feature of these frameworks is that you have sort of control over what's happening, and a big part of that is actually being able to to, to like cancel work or to schedule work and to do other things. This is something that has never traditionally been possible with thread programming, at least not easily. So I kind of want to, I kind of want to just roll with some different examples on that. Um, one of the one one example that you might consider is how this might interact with something like a lock. Already, we're in dangerous territory here. Actually, uh, as as an as an aside, if you ever read about thread cancellation. One of the things that you'll commonly encounter is, is like comments like never do this. And then usually there's like a big long line of like laundry list of why and locking is usually at the top of that list. Um, here, here's an example of what I'm talking about here. Okay, so I'm gonna write a function that just sort of starts off. The argument is gonna be a lock of some kind. And what it's going to do is basically acquire the lock do some work, maybe it will sleep for a little bit. We'll sleep for five seconds. And then um, come back like that. And he here is the issue with, with locking. Okay, so let's say your library had some lock object. Threading libraries should actually have different kinds of locks. Maybe a lock, I don't know, maybe you want a semaphore or something, you know. Cl classic kinds of like threading, you know, primitives like that. And what can happen is you might spawn like two different jobs. Like you could say, well, here's, here's that function on lock, you know, thread one. There's the same function on the same lock, thread two, and let's, let's wait for them here. Okay, so we're, gonna, we're going to wait for the, for the two threads here. And let's, let's, let's just run that to make sure that that does what we want here. Okay, so what you should see is it comes up thread one starting, thread two, one working, 
Thread two basically had to block there because it had the lock. It didn't, well, it didn't have the lock and had to, had to wait. So what's happening is like the two threads are basically prevented from working because of, because of the lock. Now, the, th the interesting case with something like that is what happens if you decide to cancel one of those things? Like, like, like case one, what if you cancel the thread waiting for the lock? Like let's say you do like a little bit of sleeping here, like you sleep for like two seconds and then you just come out of the blue and you're like, eh, thread two, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna cancel you. And then I'll join with thread, thread one. The question is like what happens there? I mean essentially you have this thread kind of waiting for a lock. Does it, does it like cleanly step away from the lock when you do that? Or does some other kind of bad thing happen there? Um, what you would like is you would like it to sort of cleanly step away. So what would happen here is, you know, the threads would start, you get thread one working, thread two done, and then you just never see anything more from thread two. It's like, basically it got canceled, and it's like, eh, done, done with that. Um, the, the more evil case, though, and this is, this is why um, a lot of people would tell you to never do thread cancellation, is essentially the, the opposite. Um, what happens if you cancel a thread that holds a lot? So like let's say you flip it around and you just decide to cancel thread one and then join with thread two. Um, the reason this is evil, it's like you have this lock, you go into the code and then all of a sudden it gets like a cancellation. It's like what happens to that lock? I mean, if you don't give up the lock, I mean, essentially your whole program is just gonna die of like a horrible death. Or actually, it's not even gonna die, it's just gonna sit there and then you're gonna do like a kill minus nine on it at some point. So, uh, so that's, that's kind of the more, the more evil case is that. So let, let, let's try that. Um, what happens here is it kind of went into thread one working and then it just sort of never came back. The reason it never came back is, it got, is that it got killed basically. You never see like a thread one done thing. So, so something like that works, works as well. So in, in, in kind of this new thread library, you've got, I don't know, you have the ability to like cancel locks. Um, just as, as one comment on this, I think one thing that probably makes this sane is Python's with statement. That is actually a really amazing feature of Python is the with, the fact that you can like use a resource and have it properly cleaned up when you're, when, you, when you're done with it, that is what's making this kind of sane. It's like if you, get a, if you get some kind of cancellation showing up, it does show up as, as kind of an exception in that code, but you can back out of it and you can clean it up and you can release the lock. All right, still with me on, uh, on that, doing, doing thread cancellation stuff. Um, you could take this further, by the way. We'll see how we're, how we're doing on time. Um, you could look at more complicated kinds of problems. Like one famous uh, problem from, uh, from kind of operating systems would be things like the dining philosophers problem. I don't know whether you've, you've seen that or not, but basically the problem is you have like five philosophers sitting around at a table, and then on the table you've got five chopsticks. So maybe that you have these, uh, these chopsticks on the table which are represented as locks. Okay, so you have, you have five chopsticks. And then you have some philosopher proce process that essentially just wants to eat. And the way that it, that it eats is maybe it sleeps for um, a certain amount of time. So we're gonna do like a, like a random sleep here. And then in order to eat, what it will do is acquire a lock. So it will, it will do like one of the sticks, it will acquire that. Maybe it sleeps a little bit more. Philosophers spend a lot of their time thinking, right? So if you grab one chopstick, you know, it might think a while before grabbing the second one there. So, so the idea is you have these, these like two, uh, two chopsticks that you need to, to acquire. Yeah, I see that the Trito or Tretto. No, I okay. can't, okay. Um, maybe it sleeps some more. Yeah. Am I missing a? Oh, sticks, yeah. See, this is, this is why I don't need a fancy IDE, so I just use the crowd, right, honestly. Yeah, okay, yeah, okay, so. Um, 
eating. Okay, yeah, it's like, like, like eating and here. Okay, so so you, you have something you have something like this. Okay, so maybe uh, maybe it sleeps for a random amount as well, um, and 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 so maybe that's your your program. You have kind of the the, the philosopher thing like that, and then what you're going to do is, is is maybe launch these into into threads. And then we'll maybe wait, wait, wait for them. Okay, so. Okay, we'll, we'll see if this works. A famous, famous last words if this, if this. Am I, am I missing something else here? Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, that one, yeah, okay. I like this. this uh, wait just means that they don't, re like, if, you're not, if you don't care about the result, you can just wait for them. Join will return a result if you want it, but maybe maybe you want the old behavior, you know. So let's just see what happens there. So so that code, um, the first time I run it, it, it seems to work. Uh, the the big reason why people care about the the dining philosophers, though, is that oftentimes it does not work. We'll see if it fails. Okay, so. Right now, it's basically not doing every, anything at all. Um, the, the, the problem here is that, the, the, well, the, basically the gist of the problem is in order to eat, you need two chopsticks, but there's only five. And what has happened is like every philosopher has reached out to one chopstick and then nobody can make any progress, right? It, it, it's like, okay, so the whole thing is deadlocked. So the philosophers all starve and die. And now we're into like the, the dying philosopher talk and it's like, oh, you know, that's, that's bad there. So, so so you spend a lot of time in like operating systems, you know, thinking it's like, well, okay, how do we avoid this? How do we make the, the philosophers, you know, play nice with each other and, and, and so forth? Um, we're not gonna do that because, you know, the age of diplomacy is over, so, you know, that kind of, kind of thing. So, so instead what we might do here is, um, we could, maybe we could just drop like a timeout on this thing. Like we could say like, you know, with, uh, with you know, thread O timeout after, um, I don't know, after 10 seconds or something. So we're gonna, we're gonna try to do this, this like waiting thing. And then instead of trying to avoid deadlock, um, we're just gonna do like a, a deadlock recovery thing. This is, this is by no means graceful, but what we'll do is uh, we'll pick out like a random philosopher and we'll just cancel it. The, the, the thinking here is that you, if, you, if, you just, if one of the philosophers dies, it will drop its chopstick and then the rest of them can make progress, basically. So, so um, yeah, I gotta, gotta fix that. Um, so so we'll, we'll, do, we'll do that, I don't know. Let's, 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 try, let's try running that. Actually, actually you know, if, if the philosophers do have the option of dying, we probably should give them like some option to ponder it briefly, actually. So, um, <laughs> I put it put an F string in there just for extra effect there. Okay, so um, so let, let's let's try. Okay, so. Hmm. Okay, so it looks like it's like maybe immediately dead already here, um, deadlock. Um, what was my timeout? Ten seconds. Oh, random int. Oh, okay. Well, you got you got you got the you did see the timeout there, so let's uh, let's let's try it again. All right, dead, deadlocked, deadlocked again. So the, so the thing is kind of it's 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 wedged, but if it's working right, it should just pick a random philosopher and then the rest of them the rest of them wake up but what is death okay so that is that's actually kind of cool it's, it's like huh you had like thread holding you know holding locks and you just blow it away and like everything 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 works of course, of course diplomacy is not restored there but that's uh, okay so that's like another another example um, some other things that you that you might want with this this thread library, um, I don't know what example we're up to here, um, would be things like queuing kinds of stuff. One common thing that I that I often have to do in 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 thread code is I often do like producer consumer types of problems, like you know creating worker tasks and so forth. Like maybe you have a queue. 
we'll do something like this, like item is equal to q get. By the way, this, this would be one place to use this new like PEP 572 stuff. Not to, not to open up that battle in this talk, but uh, you, could, you could do while item you know, equals q get or something. But let, let, let's, stay, let's stay away from that, okay. So, um, but you, you, okay, so you could do you know, while true, get the item. Maybe I'm gonna catch like this, this except, exception here. Okay, so I, I, I kind of do this stuff with, with workers a lot. So here, here's, here, here's what's gonna happen here. Um, maybe you wanna create like, a, like some kind of worker pool. Okay, so you're gonna, you're gonna create like a, like a queue of, of some kind. And then what I wanna do is I wanna launch a whole bunch of workers, but I want them to be under like some kind of central control of, of, of some sort. Um, one of the things that's really cool that's going on in kind of the async world right now is a whole bunch of stuff with like threat, like task groups and cancellation sorts of stuff. This is, this is something that, that Nathaniel Smith is working on a lot, like the TRIO project, if you've encountered that. So it would be really cool to have something like that in our, in our thread library. Like maybe we could make like a thread group of some kind where you create a group of threads and then you could, you could basically launch, like you'd say, okay, I'm gonna make like four workers I don't know, I, I'm, I'm gonna give them a label here just so, so you can see that. So, so what's gonna happen is you're, you're essentially gonna launch like a bunch of workers under the control of like a thread group or something. And then I'll feed, I'll feed them some work. Like maybe I'll, I'll, I'll just drop stuff onto the queue. I'm gonna slow it down a little bit just so you can see it work. So we'll, 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 we'll feed it onto the queue there. One thing with queues, by the way, is they do have a signaling mechanism in there. This is, this is basically from Python standard libraries. You can do a task done. So I'll come down here, and then I'll, I'll join with the queue. And then one of the problems that you have with these work queues is how do you get all the workers to, to shut down? I don't know whether anybody's encountered this problem of like you launch something, but then you have to have it shut down. Um, common way to do that is maybe you put like a special value on the queue, like a none or some kind of sentinel or something like that. We don't want to do that. We just, want to, we just want to nuke everything. It's like cancel remaining and then like we're, we're done, essentially. So, um, so we, we would really like to do something like that. So it's like spawn workers, you know, give them some work, join with it, and then, and then when we're done, just, you know, just clean the whole thing up. So let's see if that works. Oh, no, well, G is the group. But Q is the Q. It turns out Qs actually have a join mechanism on there. Um, there's like task done, which sort of tells you that you did something with it, and then you can use a you can use join to basically wait for the Q to process all the things. So that's um, no, a great question, and it's very subtle. It's a it's a place where I could have made a mistake actually. But no, we're waiting waiting for the Q to kind of kind of finish up. But that's. That's kind of cool. It's like, hmm, just canceled, canceled all the things. Uh, turns out you could probably clean that up even further. Um, one of the things that, that, that is sometimes done with these like thread groups or task groups is you can give different policies for how to, how to process it. What I'm doing here is I'm saying, well, make a thread group weight equals none. That, that's sort of the we wait for nobody policy. Um, and what happens is if the code ever leaves this with statement, it will just blow away any thread that was still active at that time. So, so you can do some, some, some modifications like that. Um, Oh, like the ordering of that? Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. You want it to be predictable? What? You know. <laughs> um, it, 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 there is some, some element of fairness in that, but that might be an accident. So I'm not, I'm not willing to bet, bet on that. Um, one, one thing I also um, do want to talk about, I want to go back to this spinning thing for a second here. Okay. 
I had this example with CPU-bound tasks at one, at one point. Um, I want to emphasize that everything that's going on here is thread code. I mean, it's, it's like if I, if I were to come in here and just say like thread o spawn spin at the, at, the, at the start of this thing and then run it, you will see it. Um, oh, I have to give it some arguments here, like, like spin from like 60 million like that and, and, and run it, you will see that running concurrently with the other code. So it's like it's getting workers and then you see the spin stuff happening at the same time. The presence of that CPU bound loop, it's not shutting down the rest of it. Like, so this is not, this is not async that's, that's going on here. Um, I also want to uh, point out that the, 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 the cancellation on this is also not totally unconstrained. It turns out that if you were to put that spin thing like like on a like on a thread group like that, like let's do a, like maybe a hundred million or something like that, um, the code will um, that will work, but you can't actually cancel anything that is spinning on the CPU. That is um, actually probably a very good thing in a thread library. It turns out if you allow something to be canceled just on some random instruction, that's really bad. Um, so in this, in this framework, the cancellation actually can only take place on things that block. So, uh, so things like um, get operations, um, blocking on sockets, that, that sort of thing. Okay, so, so that's, that's kind of, a, kind of another, another interesting thing. Um, now, a final thing, I'm getting, I'm getting kind of a five minute timer here. We're almost, almost done. Uh, you would definitely want this thread library to be able to work with things like sockets and other things for like network programming. So the final thing that I'm gonna, that I'm gonna do here is do a die request exam. Now this is not that I, okay, this is not, a, a, I love requests. Um, what I'm talking about here is it would be really cool if you could take like this, this library, you know, like the Thredo thing, and then let's say Thredo had like, I don't know, some kind of magic thing that you could do. Um, we're not going to get into the details of that, but like let's say you could, uh, yeah, you don't want to know that. Imp import request, um, and then maybe, I don't know, maybe you could have some function where, um, you, you fire off like a, like a request somewhere. But you, you have the ability to cancel it. Okay, so maybe you do something like, uh, do some, something like this, like this. You'd say, okay, let's, let's make like a thread group. Um, we're gonna wait for anything to finish. And then we're just gonna fire off a whole bunch of stuff here. Like, let's, let's, let's go spawn like the function off. So we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna spawn like four copies of this request thing off. And then maybe we'll just print out the result of the one that completed. Yes, <laughs> we'll talk later. Yes, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the only way to get the cool highlighting on it. Actually, no, I, I don't know. Are you, are you horrified by it? Yeah, pro probably, yeah, okay. So, 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 the, so the idea here, I, I hope that this server is right. So we're gonna fire off requests to a server, four of them kind of in parallel, and then the, I, the idea is um, I, wanna, I wanna print the result of whichever the first one that finished is. Like slight indentation problem there. So let's, let's try that one. Okay, eh, task group, connection error. I might have like, let me, I might not have a server running on that, so let me check it real quick here. Okay, let's run that again. Okay, so this thing is, it's kind of just sitting there. It slowed down on purpose, so waiting. Um, yeah, we're getting another error there. Um, Oh, well, I did get a canceled there, okay. Um, so, 
so the idea on that is it basically did get a response. It, something happened, but then it canceled the, it canceled the other ones. Eh, a little bummed that that didn't work, right? Let's try it one more, one more time here. Famous, famous last, uh, last words here. I can always use my excuse that it worked this morning, right? So, yeah. <laughs> Oh, okay, there it works. That's a network. Nothing ever works on their network. So, um, so the, 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 what happened there is basically fired off like a bunch of things to request, four of them, and like three of them were canceled because the result came back, and the last one came back with result die threads. That, that was the response from the other, the other machine there. So this is the kind of stuff I'm, I'm thinking about in this kind of re-envision thread framework, you know, it's like, okay, we're going to re-envision threads. Most of it is about just killing threads because that's like the best thing to do with threads is to see them die and, and, and so forth. But, but it, I, think, I think more than that, it's actually just having a lot of control over what the thread and like, what can you do with threads? Can you do like may, way more with threads? Can you put them in groups? Can you kill them? Can you get results back? Can you just totally re-envision that, that thread programming interface and what would it be like to to do that. I don't know what you thought of that demo, but I, I think it's kind of, I think it's kind of cool. It's like, huh, that's kind of interesting. And it kind of brings me back to the opening slide. Um, so when threads sleep, do they dream? Um, here's the gist of this talk. Um, do they dream of the kernel? And by the kernel, I mean the operating system. Like, is the, are threads when they're asleep, are they sitting there dreaming of like icy planes of penguins like flapping around and like, you know, Linux and all that kind of stuff? Like, they, are, they, are they dreaming of the kernel? Or are they dreaming of an async event loop? What you saw in the demo is that. It's a re-implementation of threads on top of async. It's a very interesting kind of concept, but I have to give you like the French ending to this talk where I just leave you hanging like, well, how in the world does that work? So we're, we're, pretty, much, we're pretty much out of time. Um, I, I guess the, the thought on the talk was maybe just kind of throw kind of an interesting wild concept out there. And if you want to find out more about it, you're going to have to track me down and answer, ask questions and so forth. So that's, that's pretty much the end of the talk. Uh, we may have time for questions or not. Do we have time for questions? There might be questions, I don't know. A few questions, but let, let, let's see if there are questions here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. Okay. Um, it was a great keynote. So if okay. you uh, have any questions, please, we have two microphones two in the mics. front. Okay. You have to walk here. We don't bring the microphones as usual. So. If you have a question, queue up, and we maybe have time for three to four questions. And please keep them short. And while the first people fighting to their way to the microphones, please always remember uh, questions are about asking something and not about yourself. Um, thank you. So you're the first. Oh, OK, so that works. Uh, so you shown those threads that do CPU bound stuff. Uh -huh. And they work concurrently. Yes. And it runs on an event loop. But it's is it like does it actually use a couple of cores? Is it like multi-processing or not? Or it, the, 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 so the multiple threads running on that you saw running concurrently, they are actual Python threads, and they are subject to the same limitations of the GIL. Okay. So there is the GIL. There's a, you know the global interpreter lack. They were just created in a slightly different way. Okay, so a bit mysterious, but a, okay. bit mis a, bit, a bit mysterious. I might, I might uncover the mystery here in a second. So yeah, okay. we'll see. That's great talk. Thank you. I, I was just wondering, are you actually using the Mu editor uh, every day, this is, or is it just for the talk? No, no. I'm, I, I, I am using the question. Am I, am I using the Mu editor? And the answer is yes. Um, I did modify it to take away command completion, though. Because I don't like I don't like Windows popping up during talks and stuff. But no, it's the it's the Moo editor. Uh, one comment, just this side comment. I'm really interested in editing environments for Python beginners, 
and I've used IDLE for a long time in teaching classes, and I'm kind of excited that Moo has, has come out in a way that it can run just standalone. I know it's very early, but it's, it's kind of, in, I thought I'd try it out, so, yeah. Have you gotten as far as building an, an actor model on top of Threadle? Uh, not, not with this project, no. So. Um, what you've shown us uh, crazy and evil at the same time, as usual. Um, <laughs> what I was thinking about, um, the Threadle sleep function can be cancelled, but time sleep cannot be cancelled. How uh, can you tell the difference if you just see a sleep and you don't know whether it comes from Threadle or time? If, if that function can be canceled or not. So you are actually onto something very critical with that. It turns out that in order for this, this library to work, you have to use the functions that it provides, like thread of sleep, like thread of lock, thread of queue, and so forth. It is very analogous to these async frameworks, like if you use threads in async IO, or not threads, but locks in async IO, you, pr you have to use the async IO locks and queues and so forth to do that. Um, if you choose to use the other sleep, like let's say you use time sleep or you use the regular threading lock, the code will still work, but you lose cancellation. That's the only thing that you, it's, it's, it's essentially like, well, because you're not using my thing, you can't, you can't cancel it. So that the worst penalty would be, would be that. Um, you're actually on to what is happening in this library. I, I, I kind of anticipated that, that people was like, what in the world is going on in this thing? Here's, here's the basic gist <laughs> of this library. Um, if you're in a thread and you block, you block in the operating system kernel. You work your way down from Python, you go into C Python, you go into libc, you hit the OS kernel and you're in the kernel and you're like dead at that point. You're not coming back until the kernel says that you're, that you're, that you're dead. The gist of this talk though why does it have to block in the kernel? No, like why does it have to block in the operating system? Why not block on an event loop? You have async IO, you have event loops. You could go block over there. Like, you know, like basically sleeping is sleeping. It's like, does it matter where it takes place? Um, and so, you know, I mentioned it's like this is a thread library implemented on, on top of async. It's actually running an async event loop in the background and every single time it does a blocking operation, it essentially says, you go block over there, like block in the event loop, um, and you know, tell me when you come back. So it's, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's sort of an interesting, you know, kind of weird, weird thing. But that's, that's what's happening. The reason that it's, and because it does that, is why you have to do the special, like you have to use the special object. Because they're programmed to do this, like, sit, like redirect. Okay, thanks. Okay, yeah. Did did you build the interaction between some async code and some thread O code in the same code base yet? Oh, um, in user uh, oh code. Yeah, so th this is, so this whole implementation is, uh, is written on Curio. I don't want this to be like a, like a, a Curio talk, but that it, it's essentially using a feature of Curio that allows threads and async to work together. So in that context, they do work together. Um, I wouldn't say that's like specific to that library. I mean, you could make it work with other stuff. I just haven't, so. Okay, Pell, it's your last and final question for this keynote. So thank you, great talk. Um, could you explain uh, a little bit what's going on with the more magic? Uh, oh, more oh. magic? Oh, you had to ask about the more magic thing. Uh, the, uh, the more magic thing, uh, so, in, so in order to get this to work with third party libraries like requests, mainly what I need to do is I need it to use my socket object. Turns out that Threado has its own socket object. And the only way that I can get it to work is to, for it to use my socket object. So uh, it, it, it's essentially what I'm doing there is temporarily replacing the socket module with a replacement. It's, it's, it would be like using the monkey patching in like G-Event or something. Preferably, I would not want to do that. I mean, you, you can actually get requests to work without monkey patching the socket module, but it involves this really crazy chain of inheritance and making like session objects and other other things, but, but that, that's, why the, that's what that was doing, is essentially just getting it to use my socket object instead of the normal one. 
Okay, thank you very okay, much, David. Thank you. Um, All right. Yeah.